One Sunday morning, an old cowboy entered a church just before services were to begin. Although the old man and his clothes were spotlessly clean, he wore jeans, a denim shirt, and boots that were very worn and ragged. In his hand, he carried a worn-out old hat and an equally worn-out Bible. The church he entered was in a very upscale and exclusive part of the city. It was the largest and most beautiful church the old cowboy had ever seen. The people of the congregation were all distressed, were all dressed with expensive clothes and accessories. So as the cowboy took a seat, the others moved away from him. No one greeted, no one spoke to him, no one welcomed him. They were all appalled at his appearance and did not attempt to hide it. As the old cowboy was leaving church, the preacher approached him and asked the cowboy to do him a favor. Before you come back in here again, have a talk with God and ask him what he thinks would be appropriate attire for worship. The old cowboy assured the preacher that he would. Next Sunday, he uh, showed up again for services wearing the same rugged jeans, shirt, boots, and hat. Once again, he was completely shunned and ignored. The preacher approached the man and said, I thought I asked you to speak to God before you came back to our church. I did, replied the old cowboy. If you spoke to God, what did he tell you the proper attire should be for worshiping in here, asked the preacher. Well, sir, God told me that he didn't have a clue what I should wear. He said he'd never been in this church. <laughs> have you ever been tangled? Have you ever been in a tangle? I mean, a physical tangle? You know, John got in a physical tangle and he took a face plant and he had to go to the hospital and stuff. That was a tangle. He didn't see there was a fishing line. He tried to jump over a barrier and he got injured pretty badly, but God brought him through it. I've been, when, years ago I used to hunt. I don't do that anymore, but I, I got into a, a, a rose thicket, multiflora roses that grow wild in the woods, you know. And I got into one of those. I don't know why I got into it, but I had to turn around backwards with a leather, not a leather, a gambus coat on and crash through it backwards to get out of there. It's terrible to be tangled. Of course, you're going to be tangled in more ways than one. But Hebrews 12, chapter 12, first three verses says, therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and protector or perfecter that is of faith for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, surrounded, it says, by a great cloud of witnesses. And that refer refers to previous chapters, witnesses like Abel, Enoch, uh, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, Barak, uh, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. That's what that refers to, the cloud of witnesses. They were all people uh, who had lived by faith. They had faith to anticipate what they did not see. They anticipated the Messiah who did not come in their lifetime. Even though they did not see the Messiah, they wrapped their hearts around his coming. They lived by faith. In the previous chapter, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. 
since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So they were consigned to live in the bosom of Abraham, so-called, even though Abraham was one of them. The term Abraham's bosom is only found actually in the New Testament. The story of Lazarus and the rich man. That's where that, st that term is found. But it can also be translated as Abraham's side or as with Abraham. And here Paul is saying that the great faith of certain Old Testament believers should be a source of inspiration to the Hebrews. Um, the Hebrew believers, that is. That, um, that is to the Hebrew converts to Christ to whom he wrote this letter. Second part of that, let us throw off everything. Not just lay it aside to pick it back up again, but throw it off is what it says. Throw it aside. Let's have a gulf between the sin that easily entangles and let us walk in truth have an attitude never to pick it up again. Cast it aside. Maybe stomp on it. If you were attacked by a critter, you would throw it off of you. Then you would get away from it. Do your best to stay away from it. And the third, it says everything, everything that hinders gets in the way, distract, keep us from reaching our goal. We can't, we can't live for God if sin reigns in our life. We have two goals. One is to live in heaven for eternity, and the second one is to bring as many people as possible with us. And the fourth part of that verse, sin that so easily and tangles. Tangles keep us from moving. If your hair is tangled, you can't get the comb through. Have you ever watched a bug trying to get free from a spider web? I've never seen one actually get away from a spider web. And I used to watch those when I was a little kid. I used to watch butterflies and spider webs. I've never seen a bug get out of there. I've never seen one. Did you ever try to get, <clears throat> like I did, through a ro multi-floor rose thicket? It's a tangle you can't get through. Entanglements present, prevent you from moving. Tie your shoelaces together sometime and see how far you get. I, I was in quicksand one time. Did you know there's quicksand in Pennsylvania? It's on Bear Creek up in uh, up near Ridgeway and there's a big sign I was fly fish there's a big sign across there that says danger quicksand and as you get close to that uh, wire it's sort of a spongy feeling under the rocks so I thought here's my one chance to get in quicksand so my friend was with me and we went on a path we went around to the side of that where you're not supposed to go in the water because there's quicksand. And I said, Gary, you hold on to me. I'm going to get in the quicksand. And I got a little past my knees and he pulled me out. But that's entanglement. You can't move. Once you're, once you're down in that muck, you can't move. You can't get one foot out of there. Stuck. Entangled. People get into entanglements with ungodly people. People get hurt from romantic entanglements that aren't going anywhere. Some social entanglements are hard to extricate oneself from. We have seen Christian believers pulled away from the faith by romantic involvements with ungodly people or organizations. We 
we interim pastored in a church, I think that we were in that one for eight months, and there was a young man there. He would have been an emerging leader. He was one of the first ones that would come down to the altar during worship time, and he was a doer. He would roll up his sleeves. There was a problem. He was guy to pitch in and do things. He was only about 20 years old. But somebody talked him into joining the Masons. It's a secret organization. It's a no-no in Christian churches to belong to that. Some churches don't care, but in the Assembly of God, which that was the... So I said, well, you're never going to be, be able to have a leadership position in this church. And some of the other believers were coming down on him for that, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't listen. I sent him a document that talked about the Masons, and he said, well, that's all conjecture. He wouldn't listen. He was entangled by his involvement with the Masons. The Bible says not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I've seen Christian people that have had unbelieving business partners. I've seen that. A lot of grief comes when we ignore the truth of the Bible. <laughs> so here Paul is revealing that in order to run the race, in other words, to live for God and accomplish his purpose for us, we have to be prepared. The preparation includes the removing all hindrances, including sin, because that's what entangles. Cross country, I was in a cross country district event, and a friend of ours was, uh, she was a ninth grader, oh, this was a high school event, and she was running cross country, she was pretty good at it. And uh, the previous, no, this was, this was when she was in 10th grade. The previous year she qualified for states as a ninth grader. She really did well. But this year, and I was, uh, there was a place where they, where they come up a hill, then they have to turn left and run. And I used to get right in that place there and get pictures of them coming up a hill because all those high schools I photographed were there. I just look for different colored uniforms and keep clicking, and I would save myself from going to six different events, just get them all to that one event. So I happened to notice down in the corner where they were running around there, under the leaves, there was mud. And kids were hitting that mud, they didn't see it, and there were, some of them were falling down, and it was slowing them down. It was a hindrance. And I went and told uh, her, I said, there's mud down there, and it's slowing everybody down. I said, if you take that curve a little wide, you can probably pass three or four people right there. Well, she didn't listen to me. She ran right through the mud. She didn't fall down or anything, but she didn't place. She only placed for, uh, for states in that, in, that, in that one when she was in ninth grade. But anyway, that was a mud hindrance and entanglement. In a football game, the offense attempts to be free from hindrances. The defense is the hindrance. It's their job to make sure that the other team doesn't reach the goal. The defense tries to get in the way. They are spoilers. Of course, that's their job. <laughs> if they're stealers, then we're all for that. The author of this letter, Paul, was himself a tangler. He was also entangled by sin. He was a murderer. He tried to exterminate the church. He tried to ruin the work of God. He was entangled in sin. And God changed that one day on the road to Damascus. Then he began to run the race. He began to live a life of service to God, a life of seeking and doing God's will, a life of hardship offered in service for God. We are to run the race marked out for us. We're to run it with perseverance. We have a, a race to run. The race is marked out by the word of God, by the examples of the faithful servants of God 
the cloud of witnesses. The race is set out by means and directions. It is set out by the word. It is set out by God's will. It is set out by the leading of the Holy Spirit. This race is a race for life and death. We can't be slacking off. Eternity is in the balance for someone. This race must be run with perseverance and with patience. We will need patience to encounter the difficulties that lie in our way. The enemy has a team of defense players, experts in the hindering, experts in tangling. We need perseverance to resist all temptations to desist or to turn aside. It's so easy to just turn aside. We have a greater example than the cloud of witnesses. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He's the greatest example, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher in the King James of our faith. How do you fix your eyes on what you do not see? We see him by faith. We are born again by faith. We look to him for our spiritual sustenance by faith. By faith we cling to his word. By faith we do our best to live for God. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And the King James it says, through a glass darkly. Then we shall see, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Satan is the great entangler. Together with his agents, demons are very real. And there are maybe millions of them. Just because we don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Sometimes they appear. Sometimes they do. I had a young man came past my studio one time. He was wanting to use the phone. So on a Saturday morning, and I, I was normally not in there on Saturday mornings, but he came by and, he, and his, his cell phone wasn't working. He said, I can't believe this is happening to me. This can't be real. I can't believe it. I said, what's happening to you? He said, there's a ghost is, that's how he put it. Ghost is in my house and they locked me out. And he said, I go to the, my, my, my truck and I open the, and I unlock the truck and the, and, the, and the locks go down. And I look back at the house and they're opening the blinds looking at me. The ghost is that are in his house. I said, are you on drugs? <laughs> he said, no. And he pulled out his phone and he showed me a video in his house of a dark form gliding down the steps. A demon. I offered to go down there with him and cast that demon out of there. He said, no, I'll be all right. But I led him to the Lord. And I told him what to do. I said, you're a new Christian. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you can go down there and order those demons out of your house. In Jesus' name. First Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. His devouring ways are not only directed at those in the world. I believe that his attempts to devour are more directed at, at God's people. If Satan destroys an unbeliever, he only destroys one person, which is already condemned. 
But if he can destroy a believer, one who carries the gospel, he prevents that believer from carrying the faith and touching multitudes of people. 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee, it says. Run away. Get away from those things that Satan uses to destroy. Run away from sin. Run towards the things of God, righteousness, faith, love, peace, and a pure heart. Purity has no room for contamination. Sin is contamination. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, verse 23, because you know they produce quarrels. Quarrels are destructive to the effectiveness of the church, to the work of God. Thank God we don't have quarrels in this church. It's all love and harmony. Thank God. Pastors will be envious, <laughs> really, because I've seen that. I've seen it. It strangles the church. Verse 24, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. There is no good sin. All sin brings ultimate ruin. If it is unconfessed and unrepented for, while all sin is evil, we struggle with our own temptations and weaknesses some sins are not visible. Envy, jealousy, hatred, coveting. They progress into sins that affect other people. The message is that sin easily entangles. It is too easy to observe the sin in other people and ignore the sin in our own lives. We need to be introspective and discover what doesn't belong in our own life. Start with attitudes, then go to actions. All sin entangles. It winds its tentacles around the runner's ankles and causes the runner to come crashing down far from the goal. So as believers, we are to be carrying the gospel. But we have an enemy that tries everything he can do to stop us from doing that, to entangle us, to ensnare us, to throw a lasso around our ankle so we're hobbled and hopping along instead of going forward to do what God wants us to do. Amen? Well, that's about half of the sermon but it's already 1213. So we're going to stop right there. And because uh, Scotty and Ruthie uh, have to go to a family event at 3 o'clock. And so uh, would you stand? I'm going to ask Hermano Carlos to dismiss us in prayer and to ask a blessing on the refreshments. Would you do that, brother? Yes. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for the gathering here of the saints. We ask you to just instill in us, Lord God, a desire to continue to serve you with all our hearts, mind, and strength. Lord. Yes, Lord. We ask you, God, to give us a good afternoon fellowship. We ask you to bless the uh, desserts and the, uh, uh, Lord God, the, the sweets that we're going to have, Lord God, the ice cream. Uh, and Lord, and just give us traveling mercies as we go about the rest of our day, Lord God, with family and friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I want to be sure to take a picture of Scotty and Ruth with the cake.
before it's destroyed.